I'm not gonna sit here today and pretend that it's easy to review a flagship big brand gaming keyboard after you've dove into the world of customs. It's not. Some of these off the shelf production boards can cost as much or more as an entry level custom. And there is a dichotomy there in that customs generally offer more flexibility in terms of switch choice, plate material, how you want your plate situated in your chassis, et cetera, but are generally more restrictive than their production board counterparts when it comes to stuff like larger form factors, access to physical controls like dials or wheels, RGB implementation, ecosystem stuff. It's also pretty easy to get caught in the echo chamber of customs and forget that full size keyboards still outsell any other form factor by a very wide margin. So the best a big brand can hope to do is to take some of the things we love about customs like quality build, feel, acoustics, the ability to easily switch keycaps and bring those into a product in their space that doesn't violate their own internal priorities or their design language. With that in mind, we're gonna take a look today at Corsair's new flagship gaming board, the K100, and see how close they came to delivering a no compromise keyboard experience. You ready? Let's go! Yo, I'm Brian P, you're watching Bad Z Tech, and today we're checking out the K100 flagship gaming keyboard from Corsair. Full transparency, this board was sent out by Corsair for review, but as you should know by now, it doesn't affect my review in any way. As this is their latest flagship, the price here is $229.99 USD, which we will talk about. It's a hefty price tag, but there's a lot here in terms of features, including their new Opex optical mechanical switches, PBT caps, controls galore, and a new Axon processor that provides a 4,000 hertz pulling rate, as well as tons of storage for profiles and lighting layers. The lower frame is plastic with a brushed aluminum top plate and black We've got a full-size layout here, plus a column of macro keys that can also be assigned with Elgato Stream Deck integration. We also have dedicated media keys as well as the volume wheel. There's no resistance to it, but there's also no side play at all, which is great. And the texture here is very good as well. Feels better than the wheel on the G915 to me. And another wheel as well. This is the IQ control wheel, which we'll talk about in just a minute. We've also got this tempered glass panel in the forehead of the board now that houses all the indicator LEDs and the logo. I like the look of it, but it's pretty tough to keep this thing clean. Though if you're buying a brush, aluminum board, you should probably be ready for that anyway. Because this board does have USB pass-through on the front of the board, the cable is fixed and it is super thick. Like I'm pretty sure Tyga had this on his OnlyFans last week. On the side of the board, you have these huge rubber pads in all four corners. You also have some routing channels under there to help with directing cables towards the pass-through. You get flip down feet here for single level height adjust. One thing I noticed about these feet is since they flip out to the side instead of front to back, your board will collapse on you if you move your board horizontally on your desk, which I do a lot more personally than back and forth. They've also included a full-size wrist rest with a really nice texture and branding. These use magnetic attachments this time around instead of the previous system, and this may be the first Corsair rest that's actually usable for me. Having larger hands, I like my rest to maintain some height further away from the bottom edge of my board, and while the rests on other K-Series were kind of a throwaway for me, this one's legit. It's nice and squishy too, really comfortable. You also get a keycap puller and extra texture keys for tactility or cosmetics. The font here is still stylized a bit towards the gamer side, but it's toned down big time from what we saw on previous K-Series boards. It's great to see. Big news here is that these are backlit PBT on all the main keys, and they were even able to get some pretty small legends that are still really crispy. Everything on the board is PBT except for the macro keys and the included extra keys. In the event you would ever want to switch these out, we now have a completely standard bottom row as well. You'd love to see it. Switches are available in a couple flavors, but we have Corsair's OpX optical mechanical switches here. Similar in performance to Razer's optical mechanicals, but they retain a design that's a lot closer closer to the MX style mechanical switch that we're used to seeing. These are very fast, on par with razors, pretty familiar if you're used to using MX speeds. Pretty unforgiving like the MX speeds as well. I typoed a lot more than I care to admit in the first 20, 30 minutes it took me to get used to this board. And part of that was down to the switches and part of that is down to the profile of the caps. The surface area where your finger actually makes contact is a little smaller than a standard cherry profile that you may be used to. So you might need a little adjustment. In gaming, however, they are in that top echelon of fast switches. They are linear too, so no bumps, no clicks, one millimeter actuation distance, 45 gram weight, and are rated at 150 million keystrokes. I'm really curious about who helped Corsair manufacture these, but not enough to actually disassemble my board. These switches coupled with the new Axon processor should, at least on paper, make this the fastest keyboard out there. A 4,000 Hertz pulling rate is four times faster than 
the industry standard 1000 hertz, but how much you're actually going to perceive in game is going to vary. It's important to know too that it doesn't come enabled by default. You'll have to go into the settings in IQ and select it. I didn't really notice it a lot. Of my two gaming panels, one is 165 hertz and the other is 240 hertz. I haven't got my hands on a 360 hertz panel yet, but it's my understanding that this 4000 hertz polling rate is going to play a bigger role in the next couple of years when the refresh rates of monitors and the GPUs that push those frames get faster and faster. One of the things I've knocked Corsair for in the past was their stabilizers. The K70 was my first RGB keyboard, one that I had to save up for, and one that didn't have the best sounding spacebar out there. Now, naturally, this is the first thing I went for. When I unboxed this, they're using Cherry Clone stabs here versus Razer's proprietary stabs. These are a big improvement over previous generations. While there's no lube visible in the housing to me, I can't see where the wire meets the plastic housing and they definitely feel and sound lubed. They're all nice on my copy, except for maybe the right shift, which has just a hint of rattle. Between the switches, the plate, the stabilizers, and the PBT caps, this board actually ranks up there pretty high in terms of overall sound profile. Where they lost it for me was the case ping that's present on my copy. Some internal noise dampening inside the case would have gone a really long way there. This can be mitigated to a very small extent by using a desk mat, but it's still very audible and not just in the recordings, in real life, everyday use as well. So it puts me in a tough spot because it's obvious that they took some steps to ensure a good sounding board here. And I want to acknowledge that and applaud the effort, but it fell short for me because that case ping, at least on my copy, is so obvious. And it's one of those things that once you hear it, you can't tune it out. So while the media keys and macro keys are pretty obvious in terms of use, that IQ jog wheel, maybe not so much. The assembly looks really nice, but it feels a little off. My copy at least has a fair amount of play to it and the whole assembly moves around in there. At this price point, I would expect this to feel much more solid and less tacked on. The idea here is that you have a wheel that controls various aspects of the system. You can toggle between these with the center button and the actions are color coded. So you'll have to commit them to memory. You have seven stock commands and can add additional hardware commands as well, which are basically macros that can be triggered on rotation right or left. You can also disable the functions that you're not using so you don't have to cycle through them. The biggest thing here for me is that the included commands aren't something that I would personally get a lot of use out of. Zoom is kind of handy to have. Horizontal scroll is okay, but doesn't really have the fine granularity I'd want for something like scrolling a timeline and video editing software, for instance. App selection is pretty handy, but you have to give it a sec to select the window. Your natural instinct would be to quickly confirm your selection with the center button, but that actually toggles through to the next available command and reassigns the function of the wheel. It strikes me as something with potential, but based on the quality of the physical interaction as it exists right now and the limited functionality, it's not really a selling point for me. Arguably the best use of this is controlling the brightness of the RGB. And this RGB, wow, there's a lot of it and it all looks really good. Corsair is top flight when it comes to not only the color and saturation, but also the quality of the animations. That seems like an insignificant point, but after using some cheaper peripherals with some stock OEM control software and lighting animation routines, you really appreciate the quality here. The side and front panels throw some underlighting down onto your desk or mouse surface, and it looks really solid. I love that they have moved that top light strip off the face of the board. I never got that. IQ software is not always the most user-friendly in terms of reprogramming and assigning RGB, but it certainly is one of, if not the most in-depth lighting control systems out there. You can go as deep with the lighting programming as you're willing to go, but it's also super easy to just pick a basic effect and roll with it. And they have instant access up top too for a quick switch that bypasses all the profile info. If you'd rather avoid software completely, they also have hardware control of all the different instant lighting setups baked in. The amount of lighting layers and profile support was already pretty impressive, but the move to the new processor and the eight megabyte of onboard memory gives this thing onboard storage capability 
capability of 200 different profiles in 20 different lighting layers that all travel with the board. So it's not without its opportunities, but I'm kind of at a loss to think about what other board on the market is packed with this many features. And while that 4,000 Hertz polling rate isn't really a game changer yet, it is an achievement nonetheless. You'd find it pretty much impossible to pack all these features into a custom board. I've never seen a board like that. And the market for like 1800 or full size layouts and customs is a really niche market. There's not a lot of availability there at all. And I'm never gonna claim to be a fan of any control software. I view it as a necessary evil to get access to these features. That said, I don't think IQ is any better or worse than Synapse or G-Hub. Everybody I've ever talked to either has a story of it didn't bother me at all, or it was a total nightmare linked to whatever software they've tried to use. The macros are handy, especially the Stream Deck integration. I like that. The biggest opportunities for me on this board are the case ping, which Corsair could easily solve with some element of noise dampening material inside the case, and the IQ jog wheel shows potential but doesn't really land for me as a killer feature. Outside of that, ignoring my very subjective preference towards small form factor boards, I can't help but marvel at how they packed this much into one keyboard, and it still manages a pretty sleek and commanding look on the desk. The amount of access you have to direct tactile controls is pretty crazy. The OPEX switches feel great, both in typing and in-game performance. The PBT caps are a solid upgrade. Just be aware that you may have to adjust a bit to get used to the smaller striking distance or the speed of the switches, depending on what you're coming from. I like that if you don't like the caps, you have the flexibility to replace them, though no aftermarket custom cable support here. Stabilizers feel good for a production board. The RGB can be as full-blown bananas or as dialed back as you prefer. The underglow is always a hit with me. It's unlikely that we will see hot swap become a regular feature on production boards because it has a tendency to greatly increase the failure rate because of the user interaction. The pricing, well, that's a little trickier. At $229.99 US, it goes right up against the flagship offerings from Razer and Logitech. If you go Razer, you get wireless, but no optical switches, no PBT caps, and more stripped down physical control features. If you go Logitech, you get wireless again, but it's a TKL layout and low profile switches, and going wireless in their full size layout will get you for $249.99. You also have the SteelSeries Apex Pro hanging out there as well at like $199, but I haven't spent any time with that. So is it expensive? Yeah, it's expensive, but for better or worse, it seems to be consistent with the market. So there it is. If you're looking for hot swap, lube switches, brass plates, this isn't it. If you're looking for a full, and I mean very full featured gaming keyboard with a host of solid improvements over previous gen, the K100 makes a very suitable centerpiece for your gaming setup. As always, affiliate links down in the description. Any questions over anything we talked about today, hit me in the comments or drop by the Discord. And that's it for this time. I'm Brian P. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button. Hit that sub button, and until next time, stay up.